Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. everyone and thank you for listening to the Future Audio Podcast. Tonight we're joined by Jeff Anders. Jeff is the founder and executive director of Leverage Research, a research institute that studies and supports early stage science. Jeff studies the role of knowledge in society, exploring topics ranging from the role of philosophy to practical questions about designing research programs in underdeveloped fields. More recently, he has focused on what we can learn from the history of science and how to understand and improve the institutions of knowledge in our society. We hope you like this podcast, and if you do, don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so that we can keep bringing you this great content. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I don't know if you remember this, but you and I have actually met before. So a couple of years back, I was flown out to Leverage Research for a, mm-hmm. uh, a workshop you guys were putting on. And that's where I met Connor White Sullivan and got involved with Rome and all oh, that stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Wh- um, which which workshop was that? <laughs> oh, it was, uh, I think you were testing out, I forget what you called it, but it was the the mind mapping stuff that you were doing, like mapping people's goals and their ambitions. Oh, yeah. Like surfacing okay. psychological problems. What, what, so. Yeah. What, what year was that? Oh, it would have been... 18 probably 17 18. <laughs> okay yeah it sounds like that that probably was paradigm which is a, that's right a, that's it, or, yeah. or it's a sort of organization that's been related to leverage research but yeah yeah very nice Great. <laughs> and uh, i remember thinking uh, a couple months ago I, I was thinking i need to get jeff from leverage research on and then yeah. i actually invited you jeff anders independently of that because i heard you on patterson in pursuit but, oh, cool. Yeah, Interesting. But, All right. Well, small world. But I, I thought I, I kept in my mind, I was thinking you were Anders Sandberg. I was like, OK, so I need to invite Anders. Oh, Sandberg. Yeah. <laughs> but you should definitely talk to him. Oh, he's no, great. We, we definitely will. He's a brilliant dude. He's like one of the smartest people on Twitter. But he, he's like in Sweden or Finland. And it's just like, oh, the, the time zones. And, you know, like it's, it's such yeah. a pain to try to coordinate around that. I, I think I think he's in Oxford. Um, but yeah. Oh, if he's in Oxford, that actually won't be too hard. Uh, we we uh, correspond with the British. I'm not I'm not sure. I've spoken to him recently, but you should have him on the show. Yeah. But uh that, that struck me as a, a sort of case of like misknowledge or, or a, a knowledge that wasn't handled correctly. And given, given yeah. that leverage is so interested in knowledge and how it accumulates in society, I mm-hmm. thought maybe we could use that fairly labored uh, setup <laughs> sure. as sort of a jumping board. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Sort of set <laughs> intro. <laughs> yeah. So, so what is knowledge? Uh, how do you define that? What, what brings you to kind of the study of it and how it accumulates? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a super interesting question. I mean, uh, so obviously there are philosophers who labor over the question of what knowledge is. You've got your standard justified true belief accounts, and there's sort of like a lot of uh, a lot of sort of uh, esoteric or obscure yeah. speculation on that. Um, when I think about knowledge, I mean, I would I would love to be able to define it really well, but when I think about it, I think about it as um, involving a certain type of solid truth. Um, I think about truth as involving both accuracy, but also sort of guiding us properly. I mean, people usually think when they think about truth, think about its correspondence to reality, like that factor. But I think in everyday practice, when people talk about whether something's true, they also like think about whether it guides us well. And then uh, I think about knowledge as adding to that solidity, where it's like if we have sort of the analogy of taking a step forward, you know, you might be, you know, you know, you might take a step and it might be the true one or the correct one. Um, but maybe you don't know that that's the case. Um, and if you don't know that that's the case, then it's somehow less solid. Um, and so then I think about aiming for knowledge as aiming for uh, a type of reliability in the things that we believe um, with, and then, yeah, so I mean, that, and then a bunch of other thoughts on it, but that's roughly how I think about it. So, if, so if I say this is a lie, is that true or is it false or is it what lie? Uh, <laughs> you mean referring to itself? So, a liar's right, paradox. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, 
you know, fun to be put on the spot to answer age old philosophical uh, <laughs> questions. Right but I, I mean, I, right I do. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that's, that's great. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, obviously this sentence is false. If you say that it's true, then it's false. That's bad. If you say that it's false, then, well, it says of itself, it's false, then it's true. Right. That's also problematic. Some people like to get by this by saying that it's neither true nor false. Um, but that's that's not really a way out because then you can just run the same problem on this sentence is not true, um, and then you'll you'll sort of, sort of hit the same problem. I mean, my my view there is something like I think we can construct uh, sort of the definitions for um, like you know when when you're looking at the truth of propositions, you you are looking at correspondence to reality. You can break propositions down into their atomic parts. So if you say you know, the man is happy and the sun is shining. Well, if the man is happy, check, and the sun is not yeah. shining, false, oh, then the whole thing is false. And so we have these truth functional connectives like and and or yeah. that make it so that we can calculate up what the truth value is for some sort of more complex proposition. And then with this sentence is false, you sort of are trying to calculate the truth value on the basis of a pre-given truth value. I think it's a problem in the way the concepts work and we can sort of define our way out of that one. I don't know. No, oh, that's that, good. Well, yeah, <laughs> that'll be news to the logicians. We, we should. Look at that. Um, well, I mean, I think it's super tricky. Actually, my favorite one, we shouldn't sort of spend forever on this, but my favorite one is Curry's paradox. Let's have this be a thing for the listener to look up. But Curry's paradox is one of these self-reference paradoxes that doesn't re doesn't rely on not. Um, it just it's you take a sentence X and then the sentence is, um, uh, if X, then Santa Claus exists. And there's a pretty straightforward way to prove using regular logic from that, that Santa Claus exists. Oh, and yeah. then you're like, well, wait, okay, what, what's going on there? Clearly something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am, I am interested in all of those things. I think about the something like, I don't think like actual paradoxes or contradictions can exist in reality. So anytime we encounter something that's a contradiction or paradox, what's actually happened is that there's some sort of flaw in our thinking. And so I think that those are really good jumping off points for trying to figure out what's going on. Cause at least we know that we've gone somewhere, we've gone incorrect somewhere in right. our own thinking. Right. We actually had uh, Eric East, who's a buddy of mine. He works on paraconsistent logic. That's what he did his PhD yep. in. And he, yeah, yeah. he defended the proposition that, uh, <laughs> not that contradictions exist in reality. His position is that no, right. as, as far as the world goes, there are no contradictions, but you actually can uh, rig a logical system to have true contradictions in it. And then it just, you know, my mind usually explodes <laughs> at that point. And I haven't made it much further than that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that it it's in a bunch of cases, if you at least some parts of logic you can think of as being tools where like if you think, well, it's like, why do we need a logic around the concept of and or the concept of or? Well, it's 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 really helpful. Um, you might try to get by without using either of those. Um, but then so I think you can construct these useful logical apparatuses. And then depending on how you construct them, you may end up with logical problems since you just want to make sure that if anything like that happens, it doesn't influence anything that you're doing in reality. Because of right, course, yeah. we're not going to encounter actual contradictions or paradoxes in reality. Don't, don't take your logic too seriously. <laughs> so I, I came across um, the statistic the other day that uh, the, the world's base of knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. And... Um, um, they, they went on to say that back in 1900, it was doubling every century, and now mm -hmm. it's speeded up to the point where it's doubling every 12 hours. And naturally, I think it's more probably the base of information in the world rather than the knowledge. Yeah. But um, but it it occurred to me though that 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 doubling of information that often is just yes. dramatically changing things around us. Cause you know, I was thinking, yep. thinking about images of the future. If we have images of the future, suddenly we have since yesterday at this time, we have four times as many images of the future as we had then. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so that, that growing base of knowledge of information that is, is surrounding us is kind of the seeds of all of these ideas that are going to spring to life. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of what you've been doing research on, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, yeah. Where, where do these ideas come from and where do mm -hmm. they go and how do they, uh, how do they get, 
get married and have sex and give <laughs> give birth to other other ideas along the way. Idea porn on the Futurati <laughs> podcast. <laughs> assume, assume it's sexual reproduction for, yeah. for ideas primarily. The um, but yeah, I mean it's well, it's an interesting question where it seems like the it seems like we should make a distinction between information and knowledge. Right, right. Um, you um, uh, can have lots of information available, but without that information being crystallized in a way that people actually understand what's happening. I mean, sometimes when people talk about the future, they talk about things changing so quickly, we no longer understand what's happening anymore. And at least if that happens, then if we don't understand what's happening, then something peculiar has to be going on with respect to knowledge, because you'd think that if we knew things, then, you know, we would understand what was happening. Um, but even, even in a more sort of prosaic or sort of normal circumstance, there are cases where the proliferation of, of information actually can make it harder to acquire knowledge. So one really interesting example that I've spent some time looking into and care a lot about is um, what's going on in the field of psychology. Uh, the, so in the field of psychology, as of course many of your listeners will be familiar, um, there's a replication crisis. The replication crisis has been going on for about 10 years, um, but the sort of outline of it is that scientific studies are supposed to replicate, at least it's the standard conception, and then they hadn't been putting in a lot of effort to replicate the studies. Um, then some people went through and did some larger replications to see how many actually do replicate. And you get different estimates. Sometimes it's 40%, sometimes it's 60%, but it's not 90%. It's not 95 or 99%. And so then this then has sort of thrown the field of experimental psycho psychology into crisis where it's like, well, what can we actually rely on? And if somebody cites a psycho like a psychology study and say, well, you know, there's a study that shows X, you know, it, it might be a coin toss whether that study actually will replicate. Right. Now then that relates to information and knowledge because you might think, well, okay, maybe half of them don't replicate, but half of them do. Right. Um, and because half of them do, and because there are so many papers, we're gaining all of this knowledge. But there's there's this problem, which is that if we can't tell which are the half that replicate and which are the half that don't replicate, then, well, okay, well then maybe it's much harder to tell for any given study whether it's right. This means that even if there is an objectively increasing number of correct studies or studies whose results would replicate and do reflect facts about human psychology, which is the object of study, um, it might be that the total amount of knowledge we have isn't going up as a result. I mean, you could imagine like if you start with 100 good studies and then you start adding in one good study and one bad study, and by the time you get to 1,000 studies, you're going to have lost knowledge in some sort of really crucial sense. So I think, I think the increase in information is an absolute fact. It's extremely interesting, really important to understand what it means about the future and about our current circumstance. But it doesn't necessarily mean that knowledge is increasing. I do think knowledge is increasing in some ways, but it, I also think there are circumstances where I think sort of the situation is not as good as we'd like to think. Yeah. So if um, one one of the big arguments in social media right now is that a lot of posts, a lot of things are getting taken down because they're they're not true. Um, now, mm -hmm. if if something is you, you have an hour long video and there's a 10 second piece in there that's not true, does that cancel the whole thing? Um, that that's kind of the argument that's floating around, and people are wondering um, how how do we how do we actually deal with this in a reasonable manner? Uh, because if you actually hold a truth meter up to every co sure. college course that's taught, every course that's taught in taught in grade school, every book that we read, if you hold a truth meter up to everything, very mm -hmm. likely everything's going to fail uh, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along the way. So. Um, What's a reasonable standard to? So we still we still have math. I think math mostly passes, and so you know there's 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 still that. But but no, I think this is a really I think there's a great great question here, um, and it's really interesting because in you know writing there's an interesting question for anybody who's writing publicly, which is sort of how deeply do you fact check all of the things that 
you want to write about. Um, I'm, you know, very interested now in the history of science. Um, Leverage has been studying the history of science for the last, since I guess about late 2019. And it's really interesting because when we go to write about it, you know, we look at the secondary sources. It's really helpful, gives us a guide. But then we find out, well, actually you dig a little bit deeper, primary sources, sort of look at all the things that have been written and you just get sort of mistakes and errors all over the place. And it's it's not um, you know, necessarily something like bad or that the people are exactly doing wrong. There's something like how much endurance does everyone have in making sure that every particular fact is right. On the other hand, if you get the facts wrong, it seems like right. you're probably going to come to wrong conclusions. So what should we do about this? I mean, I, I love this question. And I think that the sort of thing we need to do is to develop standards that help to make it clear what type of writing something should be. Like one way, a sort of counterintuitive way to kill off research in an area is to demand that all the research hit the highest possible standard in that area. You think, well, what could be wrong about that? Certainly we want all the research to hit the highest possible standard. What are we like slackers? We're going to like allow low low grade research in. But typically there's a trade-off between quality and cost in at least some way. Um, And so I know I was talking to someone who was talking about economics and their proposal was that a lot of the stuff published in the top journals in economics now is really, really high quality. It's all very thoroughly checked. The stuff all checks out. But it's not very interesting. Um, and it's really hard to put forward interesting and new ideas at that same standard. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so, so what do we do about this? Well, I think the answer is we just need to have categories. We need to have contexts or something like that where, you know, you have you know, something where you're like, okay, I think this is the final answer and that this is supposed to be put to the highest possible test. And then you have something where you're like, these things have all been researched pretty thoroughly. And I think that in general, this is heading the right direction, though open to updating. And, you know, let's post a new version of this after we find out something new versus just kicking around ideas here, you know, half the stuff might be wrong, but I think that it's illuminating in some way. And I think, I think that, we need to have sort of an understanding that there are sort of sensible different sort of uh, levels, sort of, uh, it, it's like with events, you know, there's like a, you know, production quality you want to have a, for particular events. And you don't want every event to be at the production quality of the Olympics. You want some things to be low key, to take less effort, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, what I'd hope for. I mean, you'd want all of the different forms to push us in the direction of understanding the truth and understanding each other better. Um, And I I think this is achievable, but it's it's something that needs to be worked out. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Sure. Um, I I personally know that nobody has been to the center of the Mm -hmm. earth. And Mm -hmm. so when you see science books that depict the center of the earth, and yes. there's a big circle in the middle that calls it the core, and they say what it's made out of and everything. Sure. They're glossing over all kinds of details in the center of the earth that we just don't know about. Well, there, there was a mm-hmm. movie made about that. Some science, some yeah. It was called yeah. The Core. Yeah. And they- <laughs> yeah. So, so should we not put that into the science books because it's all cobbled together pieces of garbage? Oh, well, I mean, so in, a, in, in some cases, you know, so we can't directly observe lots and lots of things that we nevertheless have really good reason to believe exist or are a particular way. So it's like with the unaided eye, you can't observe atoms. Um, you can observe them with a microscope. You can detect them in a bunch of ways. I think the physical theories underlying the instruments, so the instruments themselves are extremely high quality and the physical theories underlying the instruments are really high quality, and those that they themselves can be checked in all sorts of ways. And so I think that in some cases, what's happening is you're making claims that, you know, in, in a bunch of cases, people won't explain 
where the knowledge is actually coming from. Like, I think this is interesting for astronomy where they say, you know, we've detected another exoplanet. And in fact, what's happening is there's this analysis of electromagnetic radiation and like, you know, there's like an entire chain of inference yeah. that's occurring. It's not like <laughs> we've seen the exoplanet in a more normal sense, but do you think we have good enough reason on that basis to believe it's there? I personally would would be in favor of, in at least a lot of contexts, including more information about how the answers were reached. I think that's that's the sort of thing that can be illuminating. And then in some cases, you'll have it be that people are filling in more than we actually know. And this is there's a sort of separate question where, and so I haven't studied geology as yet, and so right. don't have that much, just don't know that much yet about the uh, core of the earth, but the um, there are a bunch of places where you'll have answers that are put forward authoritatively when we haven't really earned the authority yet, yeah. where the sort of total degree of justification underlying the claim isn't high enough to warrant that degree of authority. Right. And then I think that's a, that's a, there's actually a huge challenge and, you know, interesting topic there. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think, I think that's a, that's a place where there, there can be problems. So I remember when I was listening to your interview with uh, Patterson mm -hmm. in pursuit, thinking mm -hmm. that I wish English had epistemic markers. And there, there are apparently languages that have this where you can say, I saw this with my eyes. I did the math myself. Mm -hmm. I checked it or like this, like I asked five smart people and they all said the same thing. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what I've got, you know, or like yep. I vaguely remember hearing about this yep. in a class 10 years ago. And so I'm wondering if I, I'm wondering how you think this epistemic categorization might work with journals and, and, and um, knowledge production more generally. So you yeah. said you think it's achievable. It, 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 it occurs to me that you have popular treatments, right? You, you have popular books and then you have peer reviewed right. scholarly articles. So what are the great that you see between there and, and how might you implement that in, uh, in science more generally? I mean, that, that's a great question. I don't, I don't have a program defined as yet, but <laughs> I, I mean, I certainly, I certainly would like to, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm still learning a whole lot about science and knowledge. And so I, I don't consider myself yet sort of well-equipped enough to sort of, you know, describe how, like exactly how a thing should look. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I could gesture at a few things that I think would be helpful. Um, I do think that the, well, and this is, I mean, this, this is an interesting question because I'm not sure how much the problem, in designing any sort of system, you want to understand where the problem comes from. Right. And if you have a situation where, well, it's like, okay, well, so what are the problems? Well, one problem is that people frequently make claims in a way that is more authoritative than is actually warranted. Okay. That's a big problem. Psychology is a great example. Um, you know, describe that already, but you know, you had, um, you know, I think Kahneman in thinking fast and slow saying that priming a particular, you know, supposed psychological effect may be counterintuitive, but it's, it's a fact you have to accept it. Then turns out the priming, literature fails to replicate, maybe priming isn't actually a real phenomenon. Well, okay, so there's this problem of, you know, the, I mean, Kahneman was himself relying on a whole bunch of studies that were done. When you read studies, studies are stated very authoritatively. Yep. Um, you know, in many cases, you'll have, you know, researchers don't mention themselves. Um, it's as though the thing is spoken sort of from the voice of the universe, the, the, you know, the subject, the subjects, the subjects were given, the subjects were given a questionnaire and the cosmos <laughs> found P less than 0.05. That, that's Therefore, right. That's point, right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yep. Exactly. The uh, P was 0.049. Yeah. Um, and, uh, With and a little jiggling, we got it to work out and it passed peer review. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so then, it's, it's interesting because, well, so there's this, there, this is one problem, which is the sort of overstatement on the basis of or sort of overuse of authority. But then there's an interesting question of where that's coming from, right? I mean, why are people overstating, you know, sort of overusing authority? Well, it's interesting because in, you might think, well, you need this in order to publish, um, but then you can push it back a further step and say, okay, well, why is that? You could easily imagine a field of psychology or other fields where it was fine to say, 
hey, everyone, <laughs> here are some experiments I tried and here are the results that I think I found. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you go back and look at the history of science, this is one of the things that Levered Research is doing now is studying the history of science. This is because we expect that there will be all sorts of things that we can learn about how science it can be improved today by looking at how successful science has worked in the past. Looking at the history of electricity, which is what we're studying right now, it's really interesting. So around the leading up to um, and then getting to the discovery of the Leyden jars, the first capacitor in 1745, the um, science just seems to have a, a really different flavor than what you'd expect to see now. Um, you, you know, Nowadays, you know, things are, are typically done in terms of explicit hypothesis testing. At least that's a very frequent mode of investigation. Um, at the time, you know, my colleague Evan Pence describes this as it's really the kitchen sink approach. You know, you have, they're throwing, I mean, you know, they just figured out how to electrify things. Okay, great. Let's electrify as many things <laughs> as we can. Hey, I, uh, you know, I, here's a tree. I'm going to electrify the tree, or here's a here's a leak, or um, a small boy, or et cetera. And you're like, All right, um, wow. Uh, but the, you know, and, and then we're seeing as we're getting later in the history of science, things become more formal in particular ways, and it actually makes sense for things to become more formal as the fields develop, as the fields actually figure things out, develop better instruments, learn to control conditions, et cetera. With a field like psychology, there's an interesting question of whether it is, how, how formal it should be. Yeah. Is this in fact a late stage science that can control conditions well and run high quality tests? Is this something that should be done in much more of an exploratory mode? And if it should be done in an exploratory mode, well, that, that sounds, okay, great. Then you could imagine journals that were set up that way. But, and this is sort of now just pointing to the sort of complexity of the problem, different groups are relying on answers from the field of psychology for decision-making. I mean, yes, I think right. one of the things that actually is pushing society and it may be, say, pushing science in the direction of making authoritative statements is that there's a lot of demand when governments make decisions. You want those decisions to be good decisions. You want them to be based on science. You don't want them to be based on some guy's random theory or some idea. And so then you get this problem where people are trying to make decisions in a way that's justified by science that in some cases actually isn't yet good enough to yield that degree of authority. Yeah. And so... This is really complex. This is one reason why it's like, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, set about doing system design when I, I you know, understand the things better. So um, it, it occurs to me that the, there's actually a, a huge appetite for this kind of thing. And you're, and you're seeing this more exploratory science in places like Substack or on certain blogs like uh, yes. Scott Siskin's blog, Astro, Astro Codex 10. Um, and Alexi Guzzi, for example, he, he publishes a lot on Substack and, and he'll just do like, I went, um, I went a month getting three hours of sleep a night and right. I played uh, counter strike and I did the following yep. math puzzles and I found that basically it doesn't matter that much, you know, and like yep. it was kind of miserable, but I functioned okay. Do with that what yep. you will. And so yep. uh, we, we also recently interviewed Gary Wolf. I think that's the episode that drops this week on, on the quantified self movement and citizen science. So yes. I wonder if you, if you see any signs of hope in some of these more grassroots approaches to building <laughs> knowledge. Yeah, at the same time, we're in this era of fake news and fake reality. Yeah. And yes. So how does that play into it as well? <laughs> yeah, this is this is a great question. I I think that it's yeah. I mean, the the fake news and fake reality seems like it's it's a huge issue. Anytime anything touches politics, it becomes substantially harder. And many things touch politics. It's almost like it's um, the mind killer. Um, well, but I you know there's. You know, it's a famous was that from Eliezer Yudkowsky. The yeah. there there is a there's there's an interesting question though because you know you can treating a so treating something as a mind killer can itself be sort of a mind killer. Yeah. Um. And so it's I I feel like politics is the sort of thing that one needs to be able to engage with, but perhaps maintain you know appropriate distance, and that will vary based on what you're doing. But try to answer some uh, some of the questions you asked. 
So um, I think, I mean, I'm quite interested in and excited about citizen science as a possibility. So one, one interesting challenge that we have at Leverage is, so we did all of this research, um, a bunch of things in uh, psychology and sociology and so focusing on the psychology, we did a whole bunch of psychology research over, you know, basically 2011 through 2019. Um, and then there's this really interesting question, what to do with it. Um, and been, you know, we looked into publishing, you know, sort of in regular journals in academia, and that seems like an interesting option. But there's this other option, which is preparing, uh, uh, preparing something that we could distribute more broadly so as to invite a whole bunch of people to engage in a sort of type of citizen science, sort of investigating. So it's like one thing about psychology is that the costs of experimentation are very low. Like, you know, you're starting with a mind, you can experiment on yourself or with friends. There obviously are dangers that should be taken uh, into account uh, carefully. Um, but it's the sort of thing where it seems like you could enroll a lot of people and then Interestingly, from the study of history, we found that both, and this, I totally did not know this going in, but the history of electricity and the history of magnetism really got started as fields in the same way, which is that you had a researcher, Gilbert in the case of electricity and Peregrinus in the case of magnetism, who put together essentially what were experimental starter packs, where they gave you a new instrument, a set of experiments that you could run, and the, what the results of those experiments were supposed to be, as well as a theory to describe what was going on. And then they released this. And then, I mean, Peregrinus, there was a bit of a 300-year lag, but um, <laughs> it, it was, in fact, his treatise that then led the field of magnetism to get going. But then you had people who picked it up, used the instrument, tried the experiments, found that the experiments worked, um, extended on that, built out new things, argued against the theories, developed new theories. And that's that's really interesting. And so th those are real life cases of how you could, um, of how fields got started. Um, and something that Leverage is exploring right now is the possibility of whether we might want to prepare an experimental starter pack and uh, for a sort of introspective style psychological research and then release that and sort of try to enroll a whole bunch of people in doing a type of citizen science on it. I and mean, that's, that's, you know, it's an interesting proposal. My over the next quarter, my, I'm going to spend some time looking into that to see if that's good. But in general, um, I'm, I'm quite excited about this. So what might that endeavor look like? So I, I wrote a senior thesis in college about introspection and that it's been sort of unfairly maligned that it ought to be possible to develop yep. protocols around it. But True fact, yes. Yeah, <laughs> great. Psych psychology got started with this sort of methodology like Alfred Titchener and, and, and people kind of like him who were, who were engaging yes. in these just sort of free-flowing interview style experiments. And I think the field just decided that that wasn't actually science and there was no way to formalize it. So what might that look like? How are you going to control for things like confabulation? How are you going to overcome the hurdles that early psychology stumbled over, which ultimately led it to abandon this as a methodology? Well, so, I mean, this, this and this is, this is a great question. Um, the, I think that, and, and this is, this is something that I think is, I would say maybe not not broadly appreciated. At least at least I didn't appreciate it until I spent more time studying science and the scientific process. Is that? I mean, we there are a number of different epistemic endeavors that humanity engages in. Philosophy is one of them. Math is another. Science is a third. And the way we understand science nowadays is that it's a group epistemic activity. It's it's. It is epistemic, but it's also done by a group. And so it needs to be that eventually the things that people are able to observe can in some way in principle be observed by other people. This, um, it's interesting, this is, I think, you know, when people think about psychology and take, for example, Freud. So, you know, you said introspection has been unfairly maligned. You know, Freud's been unfairly maligned as well. I'm not a Freudian. No one needs to worry. But the <laughs> um, uh, but I think when people think about Freud, you know, usually there's like a, you know, wanting to sort of throw the whole thing out. That's 
sort of strange given that people in fact actually do in practice accept many of the ideas, like the idea of the unconscious mind that has mental structures in it, that those structures are describable, that they are frequently formed in childhood, frequently in response to trauma, frequently pertaining to uh, sexuality. Um, and uh, these are the sorts of things like nowadays, like the idea of talking out your issues or something like that, or realizing it's like, oh, well, somebody has daddy issues or something like this. These are, these are all like common ideas now. <laughs> but if you look at how people think about psychology as a field, they're not saying, well, these ideas from Freud have been confirmed and these ideas right. have been refuted. But I, I think that this has to do with the group epistemic process nature of science where you can come up with ideas. Those ideas can be even correct, but you need to have the ideas be set up in such a way that they're testable and shareable by a large enough group of people. This is a sort of problem that I think Freud um, and other people who took the sort of psychostructural route encountered, which is that, you know, if you put, you know, 10, you know, theorists in the room and have them talk to each other about the nature of the mind, even if, even if they all start off as Freudians, let's say, after really short order, they're all going to disagree with each other mm -hmm. um, because they're investigating different avenues, sort of like looking at different things. And in fact, what you see in the history of psychology isn't that there's no progress being made um, by individual researchers. Instead, what you see is that there's this huge splintering where it's sort of like, you know, it would be really hard to find two Freudians who believed exactly the same things, for example. So then I think that were even two people who sort of take that approach to studying the mind. And so there's this tricky thing where I think that they're on to something. Okay? It's not, not exactly what any of them said, but it's, it's not nothing. It's not like score zero in terms of figuring out things about the mind. But it's not transmissible and checkable in yeah. the right way. And so then, and this is where I have my hope for psychology as a discipline, I think the thing psychology really needs is it needs some way to get information that is sufficiently cheap, sufficiently checkable by a group of people that then you can start building an actual base of knowledge. Yeah, what, I happen to think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, kind of what you're getting at is the the value of an opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Does this opinion hold value? Um, mm -hmm. And it's true that this this is what this person is thinking. Now, some people have more valuable opinions than others, but mm -hmm. if we take this opinion and suddenly we do a survey and we multiply it times two hundred people, even though they might all be whack jobs that you're, you're doing this survey with, that once you put it into a, a study, then suddenly that has value. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's, it seems, seems odd that the one person's opinion um, uh, gets relegated to a whole different category uh, in, in our way of thinking. Yeah, and, and I actually think that this, this relates to sort of the question of science and which different modes of trying to get knowledge are legitimate, where with, I mean, I think, like I said, science is this group epistemic process. For that, you are looking to have things validated across many different people. Anytime you're relying on individual judgment, then that's, that's a different thing. And then there's this question, is that a is that ever a legitimate form? Should decisions ever be made on the basis of an individual person's judgment? And you go back in time, decisions were being made on the basis of individual people's judgment all the time. Um, and in you know the when I when, when I try to explain to people the the difference between something being justified personally um, or uh, sort of legitimate personally versus um, impersonally. Uh, you know, you can, you know, for the personal source, I think, uh, I mean, it so happens, Trent, you're wearing a Game of Thrones t-shirt, so I'll right. use the example from that. The uh, Well, you know, you've got 
Daenerys Targaryen, mother of dragons, the unburnt, you know, freer of the unsullied, et cetera, the et cetera. Really like piled up towards that's the right, right. And but all of those <laughs> things are designed. What those are? Those are feats. The feats are designed to show you that you should trust this person's judgment. Yeah. Right. And so you're like, well, why should we go with what you say? And Daenerys says, well. I'm, you know, the true heir to the Iron Throne and et cetera. And I have all um, the dragons and, too. It's <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Them, so there's, there's, that, that, that's right. Well, so, but that's a different, so that's a different form of legit, of legit, uh, seeking legitimacy. The that's, uh, and it's, it's interesting too, because in a bunch of cases, just using force really doesn't appear to people to be legitimate. It's like you have a warlord or a crime boss and, Maybe, you know, you're being coerced by them and people do what they say, right. but they don't believe that that they should exactly. Legitimacy whereas, and power are different. That's right. That's right. And so I think the thing that, you know, Daenerys et al. are going for there is not only, it's not just that they have the dragons, um, but that there is something special about them that makes it so that they're a good decision maker. Now, it, it, you know, part of the reason Game of Thrones is a great example for this is Game of Thrones is like, refer, you know, uh, sort of uh, keying off a lot of things that, or at least some things that were true more about society in the past. You know, you look nowadays, you don't, you know, you have much less in the way of feats and individuals. You have a lot more going on with regard to, you know, it's like, well, you know, this study was, you know, replicated using, you know, was replic. You know, this this study is a, a meta analysis of randomized control trials that were performed using the highest standard of scientific right. rigor, um, approved by a committee that uh, itself made a decision using an algorithm that was impersonally decided on the basis of the will of the voters. And so, the voters part though is still personal. The idea is that, like the, if, so long as you tie it back into democracy, there's still a right. tie to personal legitimacy. <laughs> See, yeah. um, you, some people want to get rid of that entirely, and they're like, "Wait, why are we listening to the voters? What do they know?" Right? Um, you know, they'll say, "Well, can we just have it end with this is a, you know, done by a procedure that's been verified by scientific methods?" Yeah. But so it's it's interesting. I think that the there's this 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 very large question of which of the different putative sources of knowledge should actually be legitimate in our society. And I think, you know, currently mathematics and science are seen to be the most or among the most, in some cases, personal choice is still considered to be sacrosanct. Um, the, but then there's an interesting question, like, is there something valuable about personal judgment in, you know, different sorts of contexts? Uh, one that's interesting is like a, uh, the question of um, funding projects. Should you, the funder, think about, should you, the funder, judge the quality of the project or should you just try to judge the quality of the person on the assumption that whatever they pick um, is going to be good? And this could be for for-profit or nonprofit funding, but some funders have the attitude that they want to assess the project Others think they want to assess the person. And when like you a, want to assess the person, that's a more bet on their personal judgment. Like a principal agent problem there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, I think that adds a further dimension of complexity to it, but I believe that's related. <laughs> yeah. So. I actually am envisioning some sort of an AI mm -hmm. device that, that listens to all of our inputs coming in and it's, it's making, sense out it has some sort of a meter on it that will go from green to red or uh, yellow sometimes as it's right. ju judging everything that's coming across um uh, that you're listening to or that you're seeing yeah um, so, so i've been playing around with this idea of of having an ai device that actually protects us from all the dangers and yeah so uh information can be very dangerous if we get the wrong wrong information <laughs> Um, and so I think we're at, in kind of that state right now where we're, we have more dangerous information at our disposal than at any time in history. And, yeah. I mean, that, that, that certainly, it certainly seems like there's a lot of dangerous information and, but then there's an interesting question of how much you can actually remove 
individual judgment at any given point, like removing individual judgment itself is in many cases a technological challenge. And you could imagine that you have your AI device that is protecting people from the you know bad information, except we you know we couldn't make the AI smart enough to decide what bad information was, so we had to train it on a data set. The data set had to be selected by humans. You know we had to yeah. pick which humans. Uh oh, human judgment got into it now, um, and uh, you know so the in some cases people's desire to be protected from the effects of human judgment lead them to embrace systems that seem to not be based on human judgment, but actually secretly are. Right. And I think, they, I think there we just want to understand the actual limits of the technology and how much can we take out human judgment or not. Yeah, when I was a kid growing up, um, we all had access to chemistry sets. Mm. Every, every kid wanted a chemistry set for Christmas because they were cool. You can mix yep. things together. And then as people started figuring out all the bad stuff you could do with chemistry sets, then they <laughs> decided to just start taking them off the, the market completely. There are no chemistry sets left that you can get like that they had in the Christmas catalogs when I was a kid. Um, I remember my brother and I, we, uh, we set out with a project. We were, we were going to make tear gas. So <laughs> we, we were... Seems uh, like a normal thing for a yeah. We <laughs> how, how, how old were you? How old were you? That was a good project, and so we you know we we sent off for how to make tear gas. It was some ad in the back of a comic book, and I don't know. We probably sent five dollars or seven dollars, something like that. <laughs> it was a different time. <laughs> yeah, that was a whole different era. Tear gas at home. Yeah, and um, yeah. Well, the first uh, batch of tear gas actually worked a little too well um but then we could never get it to work again how after well that. how well did you want it to work uh, well yeah <laughs> that was we never got to that point of actually deciding what success looked like uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> we didn't even know what we we're going to use it for we just wanted to prove that we could do it right um so i i understand how we can we have all these uh, kind of dangerous things in our lives and society that we need to somehow protect ourselves from. Um, but at, at what point do we go too far in the other direction? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a, I didn't, I didn't know this, this fact about the chemistry sets. I mean, I had a chemistry set also when I was younger, the, um, and the, it, it's, it's really interesting because this is, I think, there's an interesting question about the role of risk and danger in the development of knowledge and agency, where you might want to protect people from dangers, but having there be actual dangers causes people to pay attention in a different way. At least I'm not sure that this is true, but it seems really likely to be true. Yeah. Bears scientific testing. We should do some randomized yeah. trials and whatnot. But no, but seriously, I think that the... Um, the, I think people do pay attention more when there are greater stakes available um, or stakes on the line. And then it's, it's possibly troubling the sort of way that we want. I mean, you know, so we want people to develop into, you know, agents, individuals, we want them to be able to make good choices and have happy lives. In order to do this, they need to be able to you know, make choices in relevant conditions, including conditions of uncertainty in many cases. And then if people aren't exposed to the relevant sorts of conditions, then it can be harder to learn. And then I think I think of this as this is a, a really tricky problem. I'm not I'm not sure what to what to do with it as yet. But, you know, if if we decide as a society that individuals don't have the right to expose themselves to certain types of dangers, then that is the sort of thing that likely is going to have really profound consequences on how we end up shaping people overall as part of, you know, being part of our society. That said, I'm not sure that we should, you know, let everybody build tear gas, you know, maybe there are clever <laughs> solutions where you, don't let them order the relevant things though. Then, you know, maybe, maybe it's the simple household chemicals and it's, it's harder to do that. So I, I think, I think that this is, 
there's a way in which modern society seems to be paralyzing to a lot of people where it's harder for them to develop a sense of personal agency. And I think that some of that is a result of reacting to the much greater degree of power we've put into each person's hands. Like right now, it is possible to communicate with the entire world pretty easily. That's something that was not available in the past. And I even think chemistry, I think the, um, as is, you know, I'm only sort of done a, a pretty shallow look into this, but um, when people think about technology and the dangers of technology shaping society, they frequently think of nuclear weapons. You split the atom. That sounds great. Now we have nuclear weapons. Okay, there's a problem. But I also think there is a serious problem from chemistry, where with chemistry, it made it possible for people to develop bombs. Um, and that was something that individuals could do. And I mean, it's, I think, uh, a really important question, what sort of consequences that ended up having on society and how much we trust people, for instance. Yeah, but it seems like we're actually in an era of overprotection, too. Um, I remember growing up as a kid, we had, well, I grew up on a farm, so we had access to all kinds of power tools and everything mm -hmm. in the shop. And and we we literally had access to things that could kill us on a daily basis. Basis, and we yep. were out climbing trees and building tree houses and doing things that were 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 very dangerous. Now we, yep. we all of our kids seem to have a be stored staying in a padded rubber room and um, with helicopter parents watching every single move and and they yep. they have Apple Air tags on their clothing so they know where they're at at any given second of the day. Um, how much is too much? I mean. We, we, yeah, I mean, we, this, this, we learn a lot from the, the the pitfalls and the dangers in life. So, yeah, how much is too much? I mean, this is this is a great question. I I I don't you know pretend to know the answer right now, but I think that this is the sort of question that and this is one reason I think that the social sciences are so important. The with without knowledge of how people behave, it's really hard to make principled decisions in a lot of these areas. Um, it's sort of like with the pandemic, you know, it seems like, you know, what, you know, there's tons of benefit from the lockdown. Um, and then there's also the flip side of it of well, what is what psychological toll does that take on people? Um, this is the sort of thing that we as a society need to be able to make good and principled decisions on, which is why I think that it's essential that we get the social sciences into working order. Um yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm inclined to think that, you know, I mean, society is probably correcting too far in the helicopter parent direction. Otherwise, we wouldn't have words like helicopter parents. Um, <laughs> but figuring out what the actual sources are is um, is pretty difficult. Like in a lot of cases, things are going to be driven by concerns about legal liability. Um, if you have concerns about legal, not, not for parents necessarily, but a lot of the safeties and protections that right, exist right, right. are driven by that. Okay, well, we have a famously litigious society in a number of ways. Um, and then maybe a whole bunch of the stuff is actually bottlenecked on the legal system. And I think essentially in trying to intervene on any complex, you know, any any sort of complex system, you want to understand what how that system works. And so then as soon as we get to these questions, like, are we controlling people too much or monitoring them too much, then, okay, well, we got to, we have a, a difficult, complicated system, we need to know where and how to intervene. Right, yeah. And I think we run the risk of sort of squelching the spirit of, of adventure and being willing to sort of laugh in the face of danger and get out there and, and do what needs to be done. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting because in a, in a lot of cases, what's happening is, is that the pressures are social. I mean, you know, you said the chemistry kits aren't available, but I mean, it's still possible, you know, it's, you know, for better or worse, it's still possible to order like lots and lots of things online with minimal checks. Um, and so it could be that what's actually happening is something like it's people have raised the bar on you know, easy access to a number of things. And so then 
for people who care about, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. How, how hard or easy is it to assemble the equivalent of a, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, kids, you know, chemistry kit? Um, that'd be a really interesting question to answer um, because maybe a lot of things are still possible. It just requires more concerted effort to do them. I'm interested in your perspective on the social sciences because I also agree that they're mm -hmm. very important and they are necessary mm -hmm. for making good decisions. I mean, just personally and just in, in terms of broader yeah. society, but uh, it, it seems like there's sort of a, a sickness in them. I, and I don't know really where it, it comes mm -hmm. from. The replication crisis is just one symptom of that, but there's, there's something wrong with them. So like, wh yes. what do you think that is? And do you have any thoughts on how to correct it? Yeah. So, um, so I, I do have thoughts here. I think that, I mean, this, this is, this is a, a sort of general comment. I think that the fields are, are large and have lots of subfields and each might be deserving of its own sort of separate treatment. But I think that in general, there is a surprising thing that a lot of people don't know, which is that academia and academic research very substantially changed form after World War II. If you look at a graph of PhDs issued, you have, you know, it's something like there's an NSF uh, graph that has this, but it's like 400 PhDs per year in 1910 gets up to 40,000 PhDs by 1990 per year by 1990. So that's a hundred X increase in the number of PhDs per year. Population itself grew only five times. So then there's a, that's, it's a, huge increase. And then if you look at the actual graph, there's a bit of a bump going up to World War II, but then the real, the real moment is Sputnik. After, you know, Russians launched Sputnik, we're like, oh no, there's a gap. Um, and then a very, very large amount of funding was made available to expand scientific research. And then this all ends up translating into expanding academia. Okay, great. So you might think, well, why does that matter? That sounds fine. Why not have more researchers learning more things? The thing that people tend to not appreciate is that the way that a field functions is importantly related to its size, where if you just have 10 or 20 or 30 researchers, they all know each other, they all can learn each other's research methods. They know when to trust each other, when not. Um, if you want to add a new person to the group, well, you know everyone personally. You can see who vouches for whom. That's one method of coordination. You scale up to having 3,000 people in the field. Now, not everyone knows each other, but you still want to have quality checks. You still want the researchers to be good. So you need to decide on some sort of centralized, standardized format for telling who's good or not. So instead of this person vouches for whom and got a letter of recommendation from person X, it's now this person published this many articles in these journals with this impact factor and so on. So the simple way to say this is, if you grow a field, you may also change the coordination mechanisms that operate inside the field. And the way the fields produce knowledge is not necessarily independent of those coordination mechanisms. In fact, in some cases, if you want to destroy a field, maybe the thing to do is to increase its funding by a hundred times. By increasing the funding a hundred times, you get, let's say, a hundred keep pay the same, a hundred times as many researchers. You have to change the coordination mechanisms, and that may make it so that the field then either becomes better or worse in psychology and in sociology and in a bunch of other fields, I think this is the thing that happened basically. You had a whole bunch of research projects that were being conducted before academia expanded so much. Then it expands. And it's like, if you look at the, um, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, if, if, you, if you look at, uh, well, so I, I stick to psychology right? The one thing that happens after you expand the field a whole lot is that, well, maybe this makes it way easier to adopt the statistical methods, right? The statistical methods certainly make everybody look smart and are pretty easy to use. And then, so you, you can imagine that you just get changes in the field's methods as a result of growth. 
And this, this is, this is my hypothesis basically for what happened. I think there, like, I, I think it's possible to make progress in the social sciences. It's hard. Um, it's an interesting question whether, you know, they should be called the harder sciences as compared to the hard right. sciences. Yeah. Um, but the, um, I think progress is possible. People have figured a bunch of things out, but that doesn't mean that that will work at any scale. The sort of thing that I think I would be excited about, and you have to distinguish between are you trying to fix the field or you're just trying to get knowledge, but you know, relatively small groups of independent researchers working together. Um, I mean, there's a whole lot needed to actually make that work, but that's the sort of thing that I think is really promising. So what, what might a healthy set of social sciences look like? I mean, I, I think of individual scholars, mm -hmm. usually like Samuel Bouya or um, Ben yeah. Landau-Taylor, you know, it's mostly just case study method. I mean, they just like deeply study these individual yep. things, but it sort of sums up to a lot. I mean, you can read anything uh, Samo has published in Palladium magazine. There, there's not a statistic to be found anywhere. So it's not necessarily yep. that statistics or formal methods aren't appropriate to the social sciences, but I do worry that they've become kind of obsessed with this and they have this physics envy and this leads leads them into these directions that are sort of elegant and pretty and internally consistent, but don't really contribute all that much to it. So what do you think a healthy psychology would look like if, if we had managed to avoid these pitfalls? Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a great question. I'll answer just slightly more broadly. I will say a little bit about psychology. I think, yeah, the methods are, are really important. I think case studies are great. So you mentioned Samo and Ben, I think they're uh, using the case study method in sociology um, right now, Leverage is doing case studies in the history of science. And I think case studies in the history of science is actually the right format. Um, it's not that I think case studies are the right thing everywhere, but for a certain type of object with a certain type of complexity where you expect it to have a discernible internal structure and there to be similarity across cases, but a good bit of difference despite that, I think that, you know, then I start thinking case study. For psychology, I mean, Freud, of course, did case studies, um, but I, I, I mean, my, most of my hope for psychology right now um, comes from the development of methods that allow for um, something like uh, low-cost rapid testing of hypotheses and shareable information so that you can get a sort of beachhead that you can build out from. Um, I mentioned, so I'll mention two projects that I'm excited about. One of them's my own. I'm on a podcast, so I should shill a bit for my own project, but um, I will mention <laughs> um, the, uh, so um, Spencer Greenberg is yep. right now working on a project that is trying to bring down the cost of doing your sort of standard experimental psychology by multiple orders of magnitude. I mean, the he's working on being able, you know, the, the ultimate goal is like one click replication where you press the button and it automatically sources relevant people from using Mechanical Turk, runs relevant checks to make sure that it's as represent, you know, adequately representative or things been tested enough so you can be you know, confident that the Mechanical Turk people are as good as people you'd get by other methods, um, and then runs the relevant tests and makes it very easy to analyze and so forth, and to do it with really large sample sizes. I mean, the when the you know, obviously the system's under construction, but, you know, I was, had a conversation with Spencer and we were talking about something. He's like, oh yeah, you know, I've been, you know, replicating all of the heuristics and biases literature. I'm like, how, <laughs> well, all of it? And he's, well, we, we replicated, you know, last night we ran a 700 person test with, you know, 100, 100 people per cohort, seven cohorts to test seven different versions of this one question because initial testing showed that maybe people interpreted it slightly differently. And I was like, and he's like, yeah, we got the answers this morning. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's sort of production. That, like, it, it's, it's, it's very impressive, at least in terms of promise. And the thing that I, I really hope for there is a system where people can as easily check hypotheses and check each other's hypotheses. Like replication shouldn't take three months. Replication should be very simple. Like think about the early telescope, right? Or think about the um, like early instruments used in electricity and magnetism. It's just 
extremely low cost to replicate. You can just do test after test after test. Um, for our work at Leverage, the thing I'm excited about there is introspection and uh, ways of organizing introspective reports. This is the thing we're looking into figuring out how to distribute, but um, we found a sort of informal testing internally that it was possible to train researchers, train researchers in a way of eliciting introspective reports and um, organizing the reports from people in a way where multiple researchers would get very, very similar or even the same answers from people. And that, um, and so there was like enough of a degree of replicability across people that I, I'm optimistic about it. That's why, I mean, we, we did, you know, testing among, you know, a dozen or two people. The, I think the next step there is can some of the methods we were using be scaled further? Right. Um, this is why I'm interested in the citizen science approach. And, and if so, then great. I mean, there, like with introspection, you think about cost per test. Ideally, you know, you're able to take a sample in 10 seconds, um, or maybe it's hard to introspect on, so it takes a minute. But like, this is the sort of thing where it's low cost, rapid testing with lots of ability for people to error check each other. I think that's the way forward. Well, fantastic. Um, this has been a great conversation, Jeff. Do you have uh, any any final parting yeah, words for us? Thanks for having me. Um, parting words. Um, I think, you know, this is Futurati, so we should say something about the future. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think something that we really need is a new way of thinking about a bright future. I think that the future can and should be bright. Uh, there's like, you know, you when you look at a lot of the popular images of the future, you have, you know, it's Mad Max Fury Road. Right. Um, and, you know, it's an apocalypse of one type or another or dystopias. Um, and then, you know, it's, I don't know if this is right, but I've just been seeing so many movies and shows that have time travel. It really makes me wonder, like, have people stopped? Like, they, they can't envision a future. They don't just want to think about, you know, the apocalypse in the future. They don't, don't want to think about the burnt out husk of the planet. So, so let's do time travel so we can do something else. The, I, think, um, I think we need a new concrete vision. And I think here we need to really expand our understanding of you know ex ex like what what different futures could look like i mean a lot of a lot of times you get uh sort of science fiction views of the future that are based on taking current technological trends and extending them um right. but the history of science has taught us that you get all there's all sorts of crazy things that happen like who would think so we're studying the history of electricity who would think you know you rub little pieces of amber and it attracts leaves and pieces of chaff that eventually turns into computer systems worldwide you know electrical power um you know powering you know uh yeah it's just it, it what happened with electricity was so different than the beginning i think science shows us that as we understand the world more and more, there's just, it's, it's going to take us in some sort of direction that was really hard to anticipate at the beginning. And so I, I just think that we, we need to start thinking about different visions from the future in the world where we learn all sorts of different things. But this is one reason why I love the book Foundation. Foundation, you guys, of oh, course, yeah. <laughs> will know Isaac Asimov. They got the idea of psychohistory where, you know, what happens if, something like sociology was able to be extended successfully into a science in one particular direction. I'm not saying that's, you know, that's one vision, but there, there are tons of possibilities. Um, and I think there are enough of them and enough good ones that we can figure out how to sort of navigate the sort of paths and whatnot and end up with a bright future. So that's, 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 that's my yeah, there's some well, parting fan ideas. Fantastic. We, we try to end on a hopeful note, and I think that was a sort of hopeful meta note. So that's close enough. We'll, we'll give it to you. <laughs> that was great. Great. Appreciate that was it, Jeff. Awesome. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.